So I've been getting some questions about valence bond theory, and in particular, a bit, a bit of questions about accounting for orbitals. So where are these orbitals coming from, and how do I create hybrids, and what's left over once I do that? Um, I'm showing you an image here that is actually an image of ethene. So ethene is a carbon atom doubly bonded to another carbon atom, each with a pair of hydrogen atoms attached. So we've seen this molecule before in this classroom. Um, and what it would have, I mean, if we're going to just go through the, 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 the simple rules about deciding how valence bond theory applies to this molecule, the first thing we do is we notice that carbon here has three electron domains, much like the formaldehyde molecule that we discussed in class. Three domains means we need to create three hybrid atomic orbitals. And so if we're going to create three hybrid atomic orbitals, and we think about all the atomic orbitals we've got available to us, which is an S, three uh, individual p orbitals, and then five individual d orbitals, um, then we can think about if we needed three of those to make three hybrid orbitals, we simply count three into this diagram, uh, and we, we discover that to create three hybrid atomic orbitals, we need an s, and two of the total of three 2p orbitals that, would, that carbon would have in its valence. So by doing that, we create what are known as sp2 hybrids, named literally according to the ingredients that have gone in, s and two of the p orbitals. So they create sp2 hybrids. And we can see each of the three sp2 hybrids depicted in this figure. And, and Vesper tells us that three domains will all point 120 degrees away from one another. So the angle here would be 120 degrees. Uh, and so that's what Vesper tells us, and so that also tells us how we can distribute each of those sp2 orbitals. Now we drew diagrams in class where we had a sp2 orbital extending toward the hydrogen, a different one extending toward the other hydrogen, and then a different one still extending toward the carbon atom, and that's exactly what's being indicated in this figure here. So we've got three sp2 hybrid orbitals coming out of our carbon atom, each going uh, toward the, the points of a, of a trigonal uh, trigonal planar type arrangement. Now, if I do that, if, if that's what I've got, then I've used an s orbital, I've used one of my p orbitals, and I've done, used another one of my p orbitals to create those hybrids. But that means that I've got a p orbital remaining, one p orbital that I've not touched, because I know that carbon, and indeed any atom in its valence, has three p orbitals available um, for, for electrons, uh, you know, they're available energy states. So if I were to somehow imagine how that would be left over on my carbon atom, the, the p orbitals that would have been used to create these hybrids, they'd be in the, the, the plane that is indicated here in blue. So suppose that one of those was along the x direction, one of those was along the y direction, and then when we mix them with the 2s orbital that was on the carbon atom, we get them coming out 120 degrees away from each other, but also in the xy plane. That means that the remaining p orbital, the one that I've not yet touched, right there, um, that orbital must be in the z plane, or the z axis, which is going to be pointing perpendicular to the sp2 hybrids that we've already created. In this figure, really what that means is it's coming up and down out of the plane, and that's the untouched p orbital that would be left over. So if that exists, and we know it does, and if we did some accounting of the electrons in carbon, <clears throat> which I can do uh, really briefly here, if I think about the energy states of carbon, in particular just the valence, we know that carbon has a 2s orbital, and we know that it's got three 2p orbitals, and we know that the valence uh, of carbon has four electrons. So normally we would put those four electrons in, put two in the lowest energy orbital, and then one in each of a set of p orbitals like that. But we know that in this case we need to create some sp2 hybrids. And to create sp2 hybrids we take s, and we take two of the p's, so not all three, and we create hybrids from those. So what we will get, those hybrids, will be three equivalent orbitals. I've not drawn them very equivalently there. Let me try that over again. So we'll get three equivalent orbitals, all referred to as sp2 hybrids, and then we'll have that remaining p orbital right there, not touched. So that's still in our diagram. I'm going to just draw it 
right here, maybe a little bit higher than the sp2s. So that's it right there. <clears throat> now, I also know that I've got four electrons in my system, and at least one way to draw that is to put three there and to put another one there. Now you might wonder why I would do that. Why wouldn't I leave a pair of electrons in the lower sp2 orbital? I, I certainly could, but if I did that, it wouldn't help me explain the bonding situation in this molecule. Each of the sp2 orbitals that I've created down here are each forming a bond with some other atom. That means that they each need an electron that will couple with the electron of the other atom. And so if I were to put two electrons, suppose for example I had two electrons in this sp2 orbital, and, and by the way I, I'm not sure which of these three that I've indicated up here would be this one specifically, it doesn't matter. Suppose I had two electrons in this orbital, well then it would not be available for bonding, and it would not favorably overlap with the sp2 orbital or any orbital of some other atom at all. So really what this molecule is telling me is that I've got an electron here available for bonding in one of the sp2 orbitals, an electron here in this other sp2 uh, orbital available for bonding, and another one here in this third sp2 orbital. So if I account for that up here in, in this sort of a diagram, I realize that since carbon's got four valence electrons, there will be one in that leftover untouched p. So this, uh, this p orbital here, which is indicated in pink, um, exactly matches, by the way, the p orbital over here in the carbon atom. Um, and what will happen is the p orbital can now overlap. So there can be overlap created here between each of these p orbitals, overlap created down here on the bottom as well, and that can be considered uh, the second of the two bonds in what is a double bond, as I've indicated down here in the Lewis structure. So this first one created by overlap between two sp2 orbitals, we refer to that as a sigma bond, and then the overlap created in two places now between these p orbitals on each of the carbon atoms, and together, both of these together create what's known as a pi bond. And so the two bonds that exist, the double bond here between the two carbon atoms, one of which we refer to as a sigma, the other we refer to as a pi bond. And so a pi bond is really a special thing. It's this overlap that occurs in two places. Uh, it's quite different than a sigma bond, and it's got different properties because of that. Uh, and so that's, that sort of summarizes the basic concepts of how valence bond theory describes multiple bonds and how valence bond theory describes hybrids in at least this case. So I hope that helps.